interview recorded on October 13, 2009, with Maxwell driving through the streets of London. It was touch and go. He was about to do his very last date in a week or so, uh, successful sweep of Europe, his first transatlantic uh, tour in 11 years. Steve Ripley, the London independent promotion, and PR Go, who had been working arduously to make it happen, has already told me that the artist in question never does interviews on the days he's performing. He's ending his trek with a sold-out show at the Brixton Academy in London on Friday, October 13th. I see hope slipping away until Steve sends me a text saying if I'd be willing to do my interview traveling from a train station to a hotel. I meet Maxwell after he walks through the doors after getting off the famed Eurostar from Brussels. He's unassuming, dressed casually, and with throngs of people scurrying about back and forth through St. Pancras International, no one accosts him for an autograph or stops him to ask if he really is the music man who just a week or so before held the entire audience of the Hammers with Apollo in the palm of his hand as he mesmerized with a great solid performance that included his classics and new material from his then much anticipated latest CD, Black Summer's Night. As we walk through the terminal, I share with him that he is the fourth person I've interviewed in transit from one destination to another. The first, Earth, Wind and Fire founder Maurice White in a 1975 conversation that changed literally changed my life and my spiritual direction, flying from Los Angeles to Seattle. The second, later in 1975, riding in a limousine from JFK to Manhattan with renowned Philly producer-songwriter Tom Bell, just as impactful, impactful from a creative standpoint. And the third, a few days later, after my conversation with Tom, with the artist he had just produced, the legendary Dion Warwick, who provided my introduction to soul music 11 years earlier with Walk On By, driving from Union Station to her hotel in Washington, D.C., where she and Tom were promoting the brilliant Track of the Cat album. Maxwell seems elated that he's in such esteemed company that he follows White, Bell and Warwick as my fourth travelling interviewee. We reach the car and Maxwell, 14 years into his recording career, coming off a seven-year hiatus from performance, is relaxed and engaging. All right, well, this is an interesting way to do an interview in a, in a, in a car going from uh, St. Pancras Station right. to your hotel. I'm talking with Maxwell, who just got off a train from Brussels. Yes, from Brussels. Right. Had you just, had, were you just performing in Brussels? Or? Yeah, we did a show last night. Right. A really incredible yes. scene over there, apart from the waffles and the chocolate. <laughs> There okay. some serious, serious, serious soul music lovers. Yes. I saw a few familiar faces from other, you know, sectors in Europe. So yes. that was, like, amazing to see sort of reoccurring faces. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, like, it's interesting for me because being 36 now, and I'm always very, I'm always very proud to say that because I feel like I'm, like, I'm more, much more of a man than I was, even though I was trying to, like, report a, a, great, a great deal of maturity. In, in my 20s um, but the beauty of Europe has just blown me away this mm. time around like so much so that I can I can honestly see myself finding some place to sort of settle here not permanently but just like as a getaway go somewhere else kind of a place you know wow is there any particular place in Europe that has appealed to you in that way I got a few on the list so I'm still sort of like right. you know figuring out what would be nice but of course you know Paris London yes um, you know I thought Brussels was amazing. Wow. Um, but I guess between those 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 mm. two, they kind of really kind of set me mm. off, you know, just the architecture and the beauty and yes, it's amazing. And how how, how have you found European audiences to be for the most part? Well, surprisingly, I, I'm shocked by the demographic and the wide range of demographic. I thought I was going to see people who were like you know mid 30s like myself and older. Um, you know, like the revival, so to, so to speak, sure. like kind of audience, but I was shocked mm -hmm. to see, you know, kids in their 20s, you know, yes. you know college students. Um, I was kind of amazed by that. And the other thing that surprised me the most, and it kind of shocked everybody else too, everybody that's part of, you know, this team that is from America that's been here, is that the new music w received... <laughs> Like, 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 just as equal of like of a of a roar, so to speak, um, than like the old stuff. I thought like the old records, like Till the Cops Come Knocking, Ascension, um, Get to Know You, things that I had done before would be just the things that you know would be a 
that people want to hear the most. But mm -hmm. when we get into Pretty Wings and things like Stop the World and Help Somebody and Playing Possum, which is an acoustic set that we usually do throughout within the show, just sure. sort of like, you know, um, it's kind of like coffee in, perf a per in a perfume shop almost. Mm -hmm. um, coffee beans so in, in a perfume shop. Um, but it was just amazing to me to see that so many people knew the music and, and were into the new music, which mm. is a, a, a huge compliment, you know, yes. as you move through your life and career where you don't feel like you're just kind of doing the greatest hits. Mm. <laughs> right. Well, well how, I mean, I know it's unfair to compare, but um, how, how are European audiences different from American audiences, would you say? Well, it depends on where you go. You know, the English are very reserved, you know, and, and you know, they can be completely, like, blown away and it's almost like you wouldn't know that they are um, but then you go to Paris and they like literally want to jump on stage with you wow. and actually perform with you <laughs> you know what I'm saying but yes. I mean I, I, I'm not one to sort of judge how people react to what I do um, I'm, I'm just like grateful that, that there's like an audience there sometimes I'm shocked that people actually get up in the morning or get up that evening that they get all lotioned up and you know they put their nice smelly good stuff on them and the <laughs> girls get all pretty and the guys come out because they're trying to get the girls that are single at the audience you know mm. in the audience and yes. it's shocking to me man like 10 what 11 years after the fact mm. to come to europe and to have you know such a wide i mean i've seen bankers and businessmen and i've seen like people in their 50s, 60s, and then I've seen 21-year-old girls. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, what is going on here? You know, it's pretty amazing. Well, um, I noticed, because when I, when I came um, to see your show at Hammersmith, that, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me was that there were, you expressed a great deal of gratitude at different times. Right, yeah. And if I could tell it was heartfelt, it wasn't just something to say. Right, yeah. um, and I was just curious about, I mean, it, it, it seems to that, that you really do feel that you really do it's really in what you just expressed that people get themselves ready they put on their clothes they pay their money right. so that they get babysitters yeah. they you know they, they they get dinner plans together you know mm -hmm. um it's you know it's it's uh it's money is not the same as it was before right. um you know we don't live in a world of credit cards like we used to nope. where we're just like sort of in a fantasy land about what we actually own yes so when you see people come out to see you and to represent mm. and to not only support me but the i mean i i have like probably the illest band in the world i think personally i mean of course i'm biased but I well mean, you're pretty correct i think they were <laughs> like your whole section is ridiculous yeah i mean they're i just, mean ridiculous they're amazing and they yeah. sing and then they all have their own separate records and then chris dave is a, a virtual like he's just a genius at mm. playing yes he's literally he's got like six drums he has no toms it's not anything traditional in terms of his drum setup then you got robert glasper who's like the illest pianist i mean out in terms right. of jazz right. um you know, he's got his own album out called Double Booked, and that was number one on iTunes in America. Wow. So it's like everyone's pretty uh, right. accomplished, and then they've been, they've given me this great, uh, you know, blessing, this great gift of being able to like, support my music, yes. music that I've written 13 years ago yes. over, over the course of my life. and. So it's 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 pretty pretty unique mm -hmm. and special, you know. It's and it is heartfelt, you know, because I don't take it for granted. And I think I think being away so long, kind of the absence makes the heart grow fonder, kind yes. of thing. Yes. Yes. It, it kind of, it's kind of like on that, you know. Mm. Just I, I really appreciate the audience. I'm not like you know like kind of over it, you know, like mm. how people can get after a while. They just, just a little kind of jaded. Yeah, yeah they get yeah. jaded, and you know, also just. I feel I feel validated for who I am musically, not who I am in terms of a style or in terms right. of a haircut or in terms of a a, a movement in music or yes. a, a trend or a fad. It's like this is like a real individual feeling mm. that I didn't have when I stuck when I stepped into the game when I yes. first came out in the '96. You know, so mm. it's, it's, okay. you know, it's very emotional. When we talk to you about the, I, I, I don't know if I've read any interviews in which. Anyone ask you the title of your why your album's called what it's called? Now maybe you have right. answered the question. Right. <laughs> I'd like to know why is it called Black Summer's Night? Well, it's a trilogy, and each 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 of those three individual words um, um, sort of exemplify the tone of, of each album. Okay. Black being the more sort of 
heartbroken, love lost record, Pretty Wings is indicative of, 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 a, of a relationship that did, just didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you got all these other songs like Cold and... Yeah, we want to talk to you about those, a couple of songs. Right, yeah. <laughs> Stop the World, which yes. is actually the most optimistic, and Phoenix Rise, those are the only two optimistic records on the, on the album. Mm -hmm. Um, summers is a much more uplifted feeling, you know. It's all the Black Summers Night trilogy, but for me, you. you know, Summers is more of like a, a, you know, what we'll do when you hear it, because it's all been written and done. Mm -hmm. I, all I need to do is basically do some overdubs, probably just before mix and master mm -hmm. on the two that are coming out. But, you know, there's an African gospel connection that I've always Ooh, wanted nice. to flirt with. Yes. And then on the third album, it's just a... a Straight up bedroom. <laughs> night. Yeah. <laughs> night. Exactly. Oh, night. 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 Exactly. Yeah, right. It's, okay. a, it's almost like a, a, a good night almost as well to the entire trilogy itself. Mm. So that's probably why it's called the Black Summer Song. Gotcha. Well, I did want to talk to you about two songs in particular. Sure. Cold. Right. I, because one of the things that struck me about the song was the rhythm of it. It's a, it has a really interesting rhythm pattern. Right. Um, and you I just want to... your wife or just say, you know. Say what? It's a windshield wiper. Uh, what is? The rhythm of... Oh, the rhythm? Yeah. You're kidding. Yeah, if you go to... I don't know if they even have this. You might be able to download this. On iTunes, there's like a 10-minute a, a documentary on the album, so you can get more of a sense of yes. who played on the record, because everyone that you see, save three members in the band, Latina, Timbali, and Robert Glasper, everyone except them, mm -hmm. are, they've played on the record. Okay. So, one time I was... It's funny, I was going to go meet my ex-girlfriend who um, I eventually broke up with that night, funny enough, and the windshield wiper was kind of doing this thing. I, my engineer drove me over, and he, he had this, like, you know, just this really bad windshield wiper. Was, this car was terrible. It was raining, and so it was doing this... <laughs> so what we did was we, like, dropped the microphone down from 10 stories from the studio. We recorded the windshield wiper, and then I kind of looped it, and then I kind of did some drum beat stuff on it, and then that's the deep. makings of Cole. Oh, that's you know. deep, that's deep. <laughs> and then, I kid you not. I believe you. You can hear it too. Uh, yeah. If you listen close, you'll that go, oh, that's really a lynch show ever. Um, I want to ask you about the lyrical content, obviously. Sure. So was, now, given you shared the stories you just did, so was that song written based on the breakup that Every you just referred to? Yeah, I mean, on some level, it, it, it's all, like, kind of indicative of, 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 of losing uh, a relationship mm -hmm. or just having a relationship and, yes. um, you know, so, and, and, and I guess, you know, it's apropos to sort of step into it this way because art is only really understood through some sort of anguish of pain, you know? Like, if I would have come in all, like, chipper and happy and, like, oh, my God, you know, I'm just floating through the clouds, everybody... I don't know if people really kind of like, I don't know, I don't know, I like, my, my favorite songs are the saddest songs sometimes, yeah. or the optimistic songs, like gospel music kind of yes. gets me excited, but like a happy ass song doesn't do it for really? me, it's like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I understand, well, you know I, I, mean? I, well, I think, uh, probably true to say that when you hear a sad song or so a song that has some anguish in it, it's, right. it's, um, reflective of certain emotions, obviously, right. that people experience, mm -hmm. and um, I, I, I agree with you, I tend to agree with you, that's yeah. kind of how I feel, you know, like songs that have a bluesy kind of flavor, yeah. so that's kind of my nat what I naturally kind of veer towards, right. and, and I, I think it is, I think this, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a happy song, but you it's, know, it's, uh, like, it's I think, honestly, people need something, they need a sage, they need a conduit, they need something that actually help them metabolize and deal with whatever it is that they yes. can actually process and I think music and art and literature and and you know and even like sunsets and mm -hmm. sunrises mm -hmm. and thunderstorms mm -hmm. have a way of sort of being that you know get out of free jail pass yeah. or something for people, well, so so. it's like a catharsis it's like cathartic you know exactly. you, you kind of it's like music can sometimes be the way that you process or processes people in America would say right, yeah. the 
the emotions that you're experiencing. So I, so I, I totally got you. So I felt my mm -hmm. responsibility was to, you know, it's not like I created this experience and like, you know, made it all up and so right. that I could be right. this guy who's writing the sad songs. Right. It actually happened to me, you know. I went away for eight years. I, mm -hmm. I met girls who didn't know me. I met people <laughs> I had to introduce myself to, which was so refreshing. And I yes. loved every minute of that. I can't even tell you. Because I, I knew that if someone felt something, they really felt it for who I was as a person. It wasn't about what what you did for a living. Right. Yeah. So, you know, hmm. I'm 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 grateful for that, and um, you know, I'm just you know I'm just happy that something that something good came out of something like bad. That. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you actually that you, you kind of touched on something I was going to ask you is like. How was your everyday life for eight years? I mean, did you just get up and do the, well, I guess the ordinary things, because we all do ordinary things, but, I mean, did you spend your days doing the things that people do when they're not recording or performing? I well, mean, what? <laughs> I was always recording. I definitely okay. wasn't performing. Um, I definitely loved being able to not care about how I looked. Okay. Eat what I mm -hmm. want. Yeah. Do what I want. Right. Eat how right. I want. Right. Right. Um, it was really nice, especially after cutting my hair, because the anonymity level just went to like 10. Wow. And so I could right. just okay. sort of like re-engage myself in, in society. Yeah. Not yes. that I'm like, look, don't get it twisted. I'm not Michael Jackson. Right. I'm not, you know, the Jonas Brothers. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't presume, presume myself to be, even when I was at my height in terms of, in the beginning of my success, that the world would come flocking and mob me somewhere if I was walking down the street. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't likely that that was going to happen. But, you know, just generally, it, it was just refreshing for me because I'm just not, I'm, I'm not like into celebrity. I'm like, yes. I don't carry myself like that. I'm mm -hmm. like, I actually sort of think it's something quite pathetic about, about it, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. being singled out and separated from humankind yes. on some level. And I think your work has a tendency to suffer from it. When mm. you when you when you have been um, when you when you are somewhat sequestered from 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 everyday from everyday life yeah. yeah no I'm right there with you I mean I totally get it it's actually unusual here I mean you know I've interviewed a lot of people over my life and it's very unusual to hear someone actually say what you're saying wow um, because many people live in that kind of lofty it's almost like an insulated life right. and they they lose touch with everyday life and everyday emotions and everyday experiences because they're living in some other reality. Yeah, yeah. and it's um, hard not to go into yeah, that reality that. after a while. When yeah. the world starts, when everyone starts to know who you are, you know, you can only do what you can only do based on sure. that. So for me to have orchestrated and in some ways have had just, and this was not planned at all, it's not like I woke up and said, okay, here's the ultimate mm -hmm. strategy mm -hmm. here going to go away for this much time mm -hmm. and come back and do this you know year five i was scared like anybody would be scared like wow did i just throw everything away did wow. i just did i just did i just like did i just give up the greatest gift ever that wow. god has ever given me you know wow. um mm. and in some ways that fear and that 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 sort of that that fear yes and that regret kind of propelled me a little bit more too. It kind of gave me this sense of like how it was before I even was signed, you know. Mm. It was like, oh, you know, I was making this record not because I was trying to maintain a position or keep my spot in the game, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But it was like, you know, an, an overture to all that had occurred and all that I hope could I, I could possibly regain again. Yes. So yes. that was like, you know, to come from a place that pure, you know, it only happens two or three times in your life. Right. I got it twice, and I think the only next time I'll probably get it is when I have when I see my first child. Mm. You mm. know, when mm -hmm. I see my first kid, mm -hmm. and I look into her or his eyes, and yes. I'm like, wow. Now this is some pure shit right here. <laughs> you know, but yeah. you know, it yeah. doesn't happen often. No, it's but true. I'm, I'm grateful that that the success has been what it's been. Mm -hmm. People remembered me. <laughs> well, yeah. I wanted to ask you. Obviously, um, listening to your music, I'm very conscious of you having listened to many classic uh, soul music artists. Um, I'm wondering who uh, is still around uh, that we could consider legends of people that you would like to work with. I got three people. Oh, you got it ready. Good. Right. <laughs> I had the pleasure of meeting Aretha Franklin. I'd yes. love to work with her. Yes. 
I had the pleasure of going. I've met Stevie Wonder a number of times, but when we were when we began the whole like radio promotion for Pretty Wings way back when, um, I went to his radio station. I think it's WKJLH, or yeah, something like that. And, K- you know, KJLH, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, and he and he wanted to work with me, and I was like, absolutely. And then the other person that's on my list for sure is Smokey Robinson. Oh, okay, cool. I heard a current record that he did. Yes. And it's like his voice is still amazing. Yes. I mean, like I'm like, my God, mm-hmm, your mm-hmm. voice still kills. Yeah. You know, and people don't realize how many people he's inspired. I mean, I mean, there are people who are not living, of course, that I would. Sure. You know, of course, Marvin Gaye, of course, Eddie Kendrick. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's got one of the most beautiful falsettos oh, okay. ever known, mm-hmm. ever made, ever, ever recorded. But well, there's an album. I just was going to ask you. There's an album of it since you mentioned Eddie Kendrick's. Uh, have you ever heard an album of his called People Hold On? No. You gotta check it. You gotta find that, man. People Hold On. It's actually a uh, part yeah, of a. Like it's part of a whole Eddie Kendrick's um, like two CD set that you can get, and that uh, it was a concept album, and it's absolutely brilliant. It's probably one of the most underrated, brilliant albums of all time. Uh, so yeah, it's called People Hold On. Um, so inter- I'm glad you mentioned Eddie Kendrick because a lot of times people don't. Well, he's the Oh my God! Yeah. Oh my God! I mean, just amazing. Did you see that documentary that they did of the Temptations? I did. I did. I, I think did. it was on. I think you guys did it. The BBC. I think the BBC did it. Because you guys have like insane documentary oh, about. Yeah. You have such <laughs> a. You have such a. Uh, it's like this, a different. The, the illest encyclopedia. <laughs> yes. Of, of like American culture. You have Jules Holland, who right. always has whatever's happening current. Yes. And 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 of somewhat substance. You know, it was an honor to even play that show the second time mm, mm. with the 12 year gap of course in between yeah. the performances um uh, well you should yeah well you you, you should also uh if you go to my website soulmusic.com okay it's pretty easy I to remember that. That um there's a there's a whole uh article on eddie kendrick's on that particular album it talks about the album from an interview we did in 1970 I don't even remember what it was, 72 or 73. <laughs> so that's something for you to read. And, and that, that is something that, um, you know, I think that you're right, British people, European people, and Japanese too, seem to have a certain Soul kind music. of... Yeah, yeah. That's it. www.soulmusic.com. Mm-hmm. It's not the easiest name to get, i got to tell you. Okay, I don't know how you did it. But you well, I had to pay for it. <laughs> you have to keep paying for it, keep paying. No, I just, I just want, somebody had it for sale, and I just bought it. But so it, it was definitely, much, or is it like... Yeah, a, no, it's mine until somebody buys it from me, okay, well, eventually. Yeah, I'm going to go check you out. Cool, cool. There's a lot to read. A more. Yeah, there's a lot to read. You'll be, you'll be there for a long time, trust me. <laughs> wow. All right, well, let's go into, um, so I'll ask you about legends now of contemporary of contemporary uh, music artists, who, who, is, who, who would you like to work with that you haven't worked with uh, amongst your contemporaries? Oh, geez, that's a, such a tough question because I'm so against the, the overly featured album thing. Okay. Like, I just think that albums have become compilation records, they're not albums anymore. Yes. And um, so as far as, like, sometimes when it's, like, about... I, I would love to work with Sade because she never worked mm. with anyone. Mm-hmm. But, it's a great I, match. but then, but then at the same time, it, it would it, it would almost be sacrilegious because I love the fact that she doesn't work with anyone. <laughs> so True. she's like the one that kind of like always you know rings out for me. Right. Right. Um, but you know, for other, there there are a lot of people that I think are amazing. But mm. I just I I'm, I'm always looking for that 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 pure connection that hasn't ha- happened yet. You know, yes. I'm, I'm I'm cautious of people who. You, you know they've worked with 20, 30 other people, so it's like, it doesn't mean anything right. to actually, you know, work with them. But it'd be great to work with Femi Kuti or mm-hmm. someone much more obscure, not not like a singer, or not so, obvious. so to speak, yeah, with yeah. someone, you know, like that would be great. Mm. Now, when... Like Benji, when, I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry. I, I thought that was... Never mind. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay. Um, I was going to ask you, um, you know, when you're, uh, when you're relaxing, and listening to music yourself, um, and you decide to go back, back in the day, as they say, <laughs> um, who are we most, who would, would someone most likely walk into your, t- to your living room and hear you listening to? <laughs> or your car, or wherever you might be when you decided, I just want to listen to some old school music, who would, who would you be playing? 
I mean, I definitely love Bill Withers and mm. and Isley Brothers for me kind of they just do it for me for some reason because they have a bit of a rock element they're soulful um, but they have a folk thing too yeah. at the same time yeah. and I, I love when, 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 when music kind of crosses boundaries when it, I don't feel like it's a black person or a white person mm-hmm. or you know it's just like this shit is good you yes. know yes. And, and, and I love I love that about what they do. It's particularly, mm-hmm. there's like an album called Beautiful Ballads. Uh-huh. Um, it's like a compilation record that has all their just really great kind of like heavy guitar yes. ballads. And that's kind of rare for, for R&B mm-hmm. soul music. Mm-hmm. Usually it's all computerized. It's all keyboards. It's all drum machines. But for them, they kind of always have like a bit of, they'll have a rock solo mm-hmm. in the middle of something. And I'm like... I, I, I can definitely mess with this. You did, know? did you ever hear their, ver- their, their version? Uh, they had an album back in the 70s. The Todd Rundgren's uh, original? Yeah, well, uh, uh, Hello, It's Me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then it's there's... Um, the 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 really? That's my favorite Hello, song. It's Me. It's amazing. Oh, Todd Rundgren. Yes, well, yes, yes that was the original. Yeah. And then there's... Um, they also did a version of Bob Dylan's song called Lay, Lady, Lay. Yes, yes. Yeah. That song, Beautiful Ballad. Yeah, well, they then then were... Yeah, I, I mean, I remember when those records came out and they were kind of revolutionary right. for that time because right. people were like oh, why you know and the sound it's kind of like too, right? dang well, you know in, in summer breeze and right. yeah just amazing amazing so, I'm right there with you and, and it's funny <laughs> I heard I, I, I don't know if this is true because you know people say things and you never know and mm-hmm. all of a sudden you make the power of myth so to speak by Joseph Campbell you know there's a huge power in myth but I heard that that Marvin Gaye was that was one of his most favorite apart from his brother uh-huh. that um, Ronald Isley was one of the singers that he just would just he just was like this, this is a bad motherfucker. yeah Ron Isley yeah oh yeah like, this dude, yeah yeah oh he's he, 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 he's ridiculous like he, he ridiculous I mean there's a yeah. song called sensuality yeah I know it where there's like it. no reverb on his voice right, I think right. there's just a bit of plate on the voice yes and then there's no hi hat they're rocking toms. A, a rim shot and it's just, just I don't know it's like mm-hmm, sick mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. like a mountain or something now, did you hear that kind of music growing up or is this something you discovered later in life you know I have to say you know I would hear it you know my mom was into country music my mom is from the islands so yeah, yeah. They, and I don't know if people if you know but in the Caribbean country music is Jim a Reeves. big deal <laughs> I'm talking about like I'm talking about and Dolly Parton Dolly Parton Williams and <laughs> Yeah, they love some country music. Yes, I, don't know I do know. I do know that. Um, you mm-hmm. know, so, but but I I kind of like gravitated towards it just from just listening to Kiss FM as yes. a kid, and then you know made friends, and you know growing up in my twenties, that my era was about celebrating the seventies. Right. And every era somehow celebrates the era that they were either coming up in, mm-hmm. and it just goes on and on. Like there's gonna probably be a new crop of kids that are like coming in that are probably gonna. I hate saying this because it ages me, of course, but well, they'll be talking about, you know, the 90s. Mm-hmm, you, mm-hmm. Know, you know what I mean? Well, yeah, they will. So, yeah. just as the 80s has been this big, huge thing. Sure. Um, where are we headed? Are we going to Man in Oriental? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, first we're, we're going, going to Royal Garden first, but we're going to the Mandarin. Um, so, so, you, so, we've got Bill Withers, the Isley Brothers, anyone else that we would be? Oh, jeez. Um... Bobby Caldwell, I yeah, think he's pretty yeah, incredible. Yeah, yeah. He's got like such a beautiful voice yeah. in every way. Um, Tom Blackman, he's got a record called okay. Only You. Yes. I know that we should take. I don't know. Is it Don Blackman? Don Blackman. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of him. I've heard of him. I haven't heard his music. Wow. So you really do kind of go deep into. It's not superficial. Obviously, you you really do check out um, the kind of music. That a I'll lot play of people. For you actually, oh, cool! Just so you can have it. Yes. Because I know I got it in here somewhere. You see, artists. I love it. <laughs> it's a really good, good song. It's, it's, he's he's an insane piano player too, by the way. Mm. Yeah, hit this song, holding you. You have to. I don't want to get into your interview because I know. No, it's fine. We're doing. We're doing fine. Is what it is. But he's got these harmonies that happen at, later on in the song. Yes. And they're kind of like. They're like dissonant sets, yeah. kind of, and they're yeah. just, mm. makes me crazy, amazing. There's another English guy that I love, too, I just wanted to point out, Omar. I think Omar, oh, Omar's amazing. I think Omar Omar's is, like, so underrated. Yeah. No one really yeah. realizes how instrumental he was to this, to the movement that brought us on, mm. I feel. 
Because mm. I feel like the English have a way of just sort of like starting it first somehow. Mm. You know, when you listen to drum and bass, and then you hear what Timbaland kind of created with Aaliyah. Yes. It's, there's like a thread between that, I think. Interesting. And then Interesting. there's a guy named Opaz. No, I'm not familiar. Paul Opaz. Hayden. I've heard of Paul Hayden, yeah. Yeah, um, well, he had this song with this guy called When We're Making Love, and mm -hmm. it just kind of brings me back, because I think Pal Joey was the guy who did the, the, um, the beats then, mm -hmm. when beats were slow. Yes. <laughs> When yeah. beats were slow. Beats That's a great slow. title for a so song. When beats were slow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting you said that because I remember um, doing an interview back in like 1986 with Anita Baker at the time when she first, it was, she had the album Rapture. Right. And she said that if it wasn't for Sade, she wouldn't have been able to make Rapture. So in other words, what you're saying is that a lot of times British musicians have even paved the way or opened the door for um, for American soul music artists to come yeah, through. Absolutely. Which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I think most Britain, most British soul music lovers would not really realize that because mm -hmm. well, we're, we're, yeah. we're step, we're step cousins. We're, yeah. There's like, I it's kind of it. like when you look at um, what was going on, uh, you know, when, when all the Africans were being shipped over to America and there were some Irish people in there too, mm -hmm. and they had their hymns, and those hymns sort of merged into the gospel mm -hmm. that, traditional gospel that you hear today. Yes. You know, and I think that's something really beautiful about the fact that music has always been indiscriminating in that way, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, it is, you know, it does have a universality that nothing else does. Right, yeah. I mean, you know, and obviously you've just experienced that going to Europe and oh, being in front of European audiences where probably everyone doesn't speak English. Right. I had to learn a few things, which I, I have to continue learning because yes. I, I think that the ultimate compliment that you can pay anyone is um, trying to speak so, something in their language. In their own language, yes, yes, yes.